from 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in the present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, what a blessing it is to have a deposit that is unlike anything we can receive. It is the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that gift that was made possible through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Almighty oh, God, you are so loving, full of grace and mercy. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can know you. So God, I pray that as Pastor Chris shares a word with us, from your scriptures that we would have ears ready to hear hearts opened to your word that we would be ready to go and fight the good fight and we ask this in Jesus name amen 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 so who believes that revival can still happen? I mean, we, we just sang about the God of revival, right? And that's what we're, we're praying for. It's going to start here with us, right, in our homes and then in our community um, and hopefully to the ends of the earth until Jesus returns. Praise the Lord. We're excited about that. Today we're going to finish the book of 1 Timothy. We spent 10 weeks walking through 1 Timothy. If like in part of you is like, oh, I'm kind of sad. Don't worry. There's a second Timothy. So we're going to spend five weeks in that um, until we get to Christmas and over Christmas during the Advent season. We're going to do a character study of Mary because she's our guide through a night in Bethlehem. We're going to study her life a little bit and, and talk about that before we get into the new year. And so and that's kind of where we're going. We're, but as we're closing this up, I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of the stage when we had all the little, you know, what do you call them, chiclet gum pieces that were up here earlier. Um, if you didn't know, pictures are made of pixels, right? Little dots and little things like that. And so I don't know if you've been wondering, like, what is in there? And um, Chris doesn't, he normally tries to hide stuff in there and be kind of sneaky about that. Sneaky is not the right word. Like being clever, maybe that's the right word um, in there. But um, the, you know, C and the O were because we did all of these words. If you went through the booklet and um, command and, and competency and these different words as went throughout. But in the middle, I don't know if you can see the word, but there's a word fellowship there. Okay, I don't know if you can see it. All right, there's a, we have a little help for you. And last night I made a little help for you to kind of see how it kind of blends together. And there's a little fellowship in there. So sometimes there's things hidden in T-shirts. Maybe you should go back and look at some of your church shirts and you'll realize, wow, there's some things hidden in there as we go throughout. But the idea is that we 
You, each one of us, are a part of fellowship. Each one of you is one of these dots that together, when we're, when we're, we're looked at from the world and the outside, each one of you reflect our church and Jesus Christ to community. And so we're gonna, as we dive in today, we see kind of a switch here at the end of the book. As, as Paul is closing up this letter to Timothy, he says this in verse 11, But as for you, O man of God... So he's going to change because he's been asking Timothy to set up things in Ephesus, set up the church, set up eldership, set up these different um, guards for false teaching that are out there in the world. And then he's going to kind of turn the mirror back onto Timothy about what it means to be a man of God and how he is supposed to act at the closing part of this book. And so it's probably going to be similar to us. These are things that when we look at them, we're going to be like, oh, these are things that God is maybe challenging us to do as men and women of God um, as well. And so if we dive in, we see that in verse 11, he gives us two just emphatic statements. He says, flee from these things, pursue these other things, right? So he tells us to flee these things and pursue. Now, what is he asking us to flee from? He's just talking about the things that we talked about last week. You might remember last week we talked about people that are depraved in mind, meaning that they worship the creation more than the creator, right? They elevate mankind to the same status with God, right? And then we also talked about those that are deprived of the truth, those people that want to undercut the authority of Scripture. They want to lessen the impact of the word of God and make their own opinion become higher in some sort of way. And then the third kind of false teaching we talked about last week was using godliness as a means for gain. And we talked about what it meant to, to defeat those different things. And so this is what um, Timothy is being asked to flee from. But if you realize that, if you start thinking about it, fleeing and pursuing are very similar terms, aren't they? Fleeing and, and pursuit are both involve intentional movement, one, one movement away from one and one movement towards something else. So, for example, if you were going to flee something, let's say that I was going to flee this electric guitar, all right? Because if I got on it, you would be like, you need to leave now, okay? Because I, I don't have that skill to do that. If I was going to flee from that, I would have to identify the danger, turn from it, and then make an intentional movement, same for pursuing. If I were to pursue something, the bass guitar, which actually I can play, um, the bass guitar, then I would notice it, that it's good. I would take a direction of my life towards it, and then I would purposely move towards that thing. So fleeing and pursuing are very similar. The difference between them is this. How do you identify what is good and what is evil? How do you identify what is dangerous and what is beneficial? Now, this is what's called ethics. This is what basically philosophy decides to, to ask the question of how do you determine what is good and what is bad. Yesterday morning, Paul and Robert and I got a chance to go to a seminar um, at the Center for Christian Studies about ethics. And it was asking us this question, how do you determine good and bad? I want you to think about it in your mind. If, if I were to put something here, like let's say peanut butter, would you determine it to be good or bad? Okay, you kind of have that in your mind, right? So, so what determines that is probably your taste, right? But if I were to put something up here like a rule, what would you, what would you use as your criteria for determining good and bad? There, there was an exercise that we did that I thought was really curious. It was, they asked this question, um, have you ever changed your mind about whether something was good or bad? Have you ever changed your mind and said, this thing that you thought was good, you now think of as bad? And then ask yourself this question, what made me change my mind? Well, whatever made you change your mind from something being good to something being bad is probably what is the foundation of your ethics. Or it's probably what really is the God over your life. So, for example, if you thought this one thing was good, but then you read the word of God and you're like, the word of God says, no, I shouldn't be doing that. I should be pursuing something else. And you're like, I'm going to give up that practice in order to pursue a better practice. Then you say that the word of God and my relationship with Christ is better. I'm going to let it be the deter determining factor of whether something is good or something is bad. Or possibly you thought something was bad, now you think it is good because you just feel like it should be different. Well, then who is the God of your life? You are, your feelings, your reaction 
to that. Or possibly something that you thought was bad and now you think is good because everybody around you says that. Because the popular culture says that or the mob mentality of people say that. And now you've changed your opinion. Who is the God over your life? Who determines what is good and bad for your life? Popular opinion, your feelings, or the word of God and the Holy Spirit at work within us? And so as we start talking about this idea of pursuing and fleeing, we have to understand that how we define good and bad, whether we're in this book and we let this be the thing that determines our direction or not, is going to be vital and be key. Because we flee from these and we pursue these things that are listed in the rest of verse 11. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So he gives us a list of things that are good, that we need to be moving towards these things. We need to become more faithful, more steadfast, more godly, more righteous in the way that we act. So let's break those down and discuss each one of them for a little bit. Here's the first one, righteousness. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but the word righteous and the word just are the same word in Scripture. Right? This idea of doing what is right. Now, we understand that that is part of God's character, right? We would say that God is just, right? We probably would all agree on that. Do you understand the implications of us agreeing that that is God's nature? That means that God does what is right at all times without prejudice, without partiality, that he is always doing what is right. Do we believe that about God? Think about this for real in your life. Don't just say yes because you're in church. I know that's the right answer. Jesus, always the right answer. But do we really believe that God does what is right at all times, in all circumstances? Why do we worry? Why does anxiety get into our life? Why do the circumstances that we face in our life cause such emotion inside of us if we really believe that God is just And what is happening in our life is meant for the glory of God. And somehow, through the things that we're walking through, Christ is going to be glorified in that. So then the question is, why should we, as followers of Jesus Christ, live in righteousness? I mean, we should be following in our Father's footsteps, right? Walking as he walks. Why? Because we are a picture to the world of the nature of God. An imperfect picture but it's striving to be a picture of God to the world. We, we understand this. How many of you all have heard the name that God is our Father? And then, But when we think about that, don't we naturally bring in how our Father was into that picture? If you had a good dad or you had a not-so-good father, you bring that into our relationship with Christ. We, in the same way, are ambassadors to the world. As we go out into the world, they're going to look at you and look at me and say, is Jesus real? And we're going to be part of that picture. We're going to be a pixel on that picture of whether or not people want to be a part of what God is doing. But by the way that we live our life, acting as God has called us to act. Here's the second thing. We're supposed to pursue godliness. And I've been struggling with what is the definition of godliness? What does it mean? Um, As I was researching, an interesting definition came across uh, my eyes. The idea of having devotion to God or walking in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And this definition used Genesis chapter 5. Do you remember Enoch? And he was walking with the Lord and he was a friend of God. And what did God say? Hey, why don't you come to my house today? And just took him. Right? He, did, he just left. He didn't have to experience death. Maybe later on. That's another sermon for a book of Revelation. But um, he, get to, he got to go and be with God in heaven. Why? Because he lived a life that was pleasing to God. So if we were to step back and say, are we living a life... That is pleasing to God. One that would make our dad, our father, Abba Father in heaven, excited about the way that we're living our life. And we know that godliness has tons of benefits. We've been reading it throughout the first Timothy book that we've been reading. Look at chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, which we read a few weeks ago. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value... Godliness is of value in every way, and it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So training in godliness has benefits in the now and as we walk in eternity with him. 
So godliness has a value. Bodily training, some value now, but godliness value for the now and the future. Right? Second or First Timothy six six said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We read that last week. So we see these benefits of godliness. Uh, Second Peter chapter one verses three and four say this: His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. As we seek to live a life that, of devotion to God, it pulls us away from our sin that we're fleeing from and we're now pursuing godliness with him. The next one is faith. Right, so we have righteousness, we have godliness, we have faith. Of course, Hebrews 11 verse 1 gives us a beautiful definition of faith. It says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So what does that mean to us in a practical way? If we're going to pursue faith, what does that mean? That means that we, as a follower of Christ, we need to trust God more. If we believe that he is just... We can put our trust in him that what is going on in our life is going to be for his glory and for his purpose. And so we can, as believers in Christ, begin to trust God more. And as anxiety and fear well up inside of us, we can push it away and say, no, I'm going to choose to trust in God. Here's the second thing, a conviction of things unseen. Do you believe that God exists? Do you believe in spiritual things? As we grow in our knowledge of him and, and our belief in him, these are two ways that we can grow in our faith. Trusting in him and believing in the things that are unseen, in his nature, and his work around us. And then he tells us to pursue love. Now, he told us this from the very beginning. Remember back in, in chapter 1, verse 5, kind of a theme verse for the whole chapter. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a sincere faith and a good conscience. That's been the aim of the whole book is for us to love. Well, how can I pursue this agape, unconditional love? Well, we can begin to detach our love from circumstances. That we only love people that treat us in a way that is good and loving and pure. Next is steadfastness or perseverance. We all could grow in this, couldn't we? endurance in our walk with Christ. Have you ever been at a track meet? How many of y'all been at a track meet? Have you ever stayed for the mile? And there's usually this kid who runs the first lap of the mile. He just burns it, like forgetting that there's three other laps. He has to run, right? And he's like, he's running, he's flying. Lap one, he's in the lead. At the end of the race, he is just dragging across the line at the very end, right? And isn't that how we live our life so often? We like sprint and then we like fall off. Isn't this every Bible study in any church everywhere? Week one of the Bible study, 150 people. Week seven of the Bible study, six. Right? That's exaggerated, right? But it, it, we start well, but then things come up. This is every diet I've ever done. This is every workout program I've ever done. Right? Woo, day two. Day three, maybe not, right? So we have this tendency in ourselves to perseverance or endurance is something that we just don't work. Why? Because it takes work. It takes consistency in our walk with Christ. Let's make that part of our walk. Let's pursue steadfastness. And the last one is gentleness. We've seen this throughout the book. Be ready to give a defense with gentleness and respect throughout. We should be pursuing those things. And why is that so important? Because verse 12 Right, kind of the verse that everybody zooms in on this passage says, fight the good fight of the faith. Now, automatically, like, coach switch turns on, like, yeah, let's go fight the fight. It's like pregame speech time instead of sermon. Like, you're going to fight. you got to jump in there. you got to be ready, Ryan. And it's like in, instantly, but the, the rah-rah doesn't last very long, right? Fight the good fight. If you knew that you were going to have a fight, let's say that I was going to fight Eric Peruca in one month. Let's say we put it on the schedule, you know, fight night at Fellowship Church. All right, me versus Eric Pruka, all right? Now, first of all, that would be a bad idea for me, okay? I am a terrible fighter. 
I remember my first fight in eighth grade, Denzel Wright, huge guy, ended up the same size as a senior as he was in eighth grade, but that's okay. Um, I was getting picked on. I was a chubby kid, and I was the kind of kid, I don't know if any of you are like this, when you get mad, you start crying, right? And so I was just, he was picking on me, like, stop it, stop it right now. And I remember just running up to him and just start punching him, punching him, and Denzel just stood there like this. And I'm just punching him. I'm like, no, you're not going to pick on me anymore. Right? And I'm just punching him. And then just standing there. Because I, I had like pillow hands. I'm just doing nothing. And then he goes, Poof, right, just slams me on the ground. And then I'm crying, not because I'm mad anymore. Right? And then he just walks off. Right? That's, that's my extent of fighting. Right? I've gotten a little better because we get to wrestle in youth groups sometimes. But my idea of wrestling is like I grab a hold of them and I just go limp. Because I weigh like twice as much as them. Right? So it's like, I, I basically just, I'm good at falling on people, right? I'm not good at fighting, okay? But if we were going to have a fight, I would train. I would get myself ready. If I knew there was a fight coming, I would either run and move or I would prepare myself for that fight. I start working out. I got a heavy bag in my garage. It has dust all over it. I'm going to start beating that thing off. I'm going to start getting myself in shape, getting myself ready for the fight. So this is what it means for us to train in godliness because, guys, out there in front of you somewhere, you're going to have to fight the good fight. Now, listen, it says fight the good fight. It doesn't mean just run out and fight. It doesn't mean like, hey, I need to practice. I'm just going to start punching people. Everybody I come up to, I'm just like slugging them. i got to get ready. We're, we're not running to the fight, but we, we have to be ready to fight the good fight. You know, I think about this story about fighting the good fight. And initially, I went back to Joshua, right? And we see in Joshua 1, verses 7 through 9, God speaking to Joshua about this upcoming fight in the land of Canaan. And he said this to him, only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all that the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may, be, may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, for you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So if you want to get ready, if you want to fight the good fight, here's what he's telling them to do. Dwell on the scripture. Dwell on the word of God. When you go to sleep at night, is this is what running around in your mind? When you wake up in the morning, is the word of God circulating in your heart and your mind? When you're on that commute to work, when you're at lunch, when you finally get a break from life, is the word of God what we run to? This is what it means for us to train, have this on our hearts and our minds. It says, that for then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Listen, church, you have to be strong and courageous. If you want to be a believer in our current circumstances of life, you have to be ready to be strong and courageous. You can't be a quitter. You can't run from the fight. You've got to be willing to stand firm you got to be willing to be strong, and you got to have courage to be a Christian in our world today. Now, listen, in a fight, does it cost you something? Like, even if you win the fight, you're going to take some blows. Even if you win the fight, it's going to cost you something. But we already understand that about our walk with Christ, don't we? Because what are we called to do? Lay down our life, pick up a cross, and follow him? Guys, listen. If we're following Jesus, where does that end up? Think about it. If we're following Christ, it ends up at the cross. This is who we're following. We're we're walking towards that where we're going to have to lay down our life for others. That's what love is, isn't it? Laying down my desires for other people. But we're called to be strong and courageous, not to step away. Was Christ strong and courageous in the face of the cross? Absolutely. Think about when he was before Pontius Pilate. I think it's in John uh, chapter 19 where he says this. He's standing before Pilate, and he says this. Um, Pilate said to him, you will, not, will you, or you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And yet Jesus answered him, 
you would not have, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Meaning that you have no authority over me, only my Father in heaven. And, and Judas, the one who betrayed me, he's created a greater sin. But you, you don't have the power over it. This is part of the plan that God has for his life. And it brings us to this next verse in, in 1 Timothy where it says, Take hold of eternal life to which you have been called, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold. So we're called to flee. We're called to pursue. We're called to fight the good fight. We're called to take hold of this eternal life that's been given to us. We have to take hold of true eternal life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I let other people have control over my life. What do I mean by that? Sometimes I let other people's opinion have control over my feelings and my, my thoughts and I give other people power over me because I, I don't think only of what my father thinks of me. God the Father, I instead think about what other people think about me. I don't know if you struggle with this. Letting other people, the way that they treat you and the circumstances that you're in, begin to control your emotions. But Jesus did it in this passage, did he, in John 19? He didn't let Pilate have authority over the situation. He said that my father has authority of the situation. I heard a quote that I thought was really interesting. And it took me a second. It had to bounce around in my mind for a little bit to, to really land. But this is the Eleanor Roosevelt quote. A lot of people have claimed to say this quote first. But here's what it says. Uh, we would worry less about what people think of us if we realized how little they actually did. I want you to think about that for a second. You would worry less about what other people thought about you if you realized they're not thinking about you. They're only thinking about how you impact their life. Because we as, as creatures are selfish. In our default state, we're selfish and we think about ourselves. That's why Christianity is so countercultural. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others better than yourself. See, we can't let other people have control over emotions. The people in your house, they don't, they don't have control over making you lose it. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have access to the power of God in your life to act as God acts with self-control, gentleness, godliness, faithfulness. We don't have to let other people stir up our emotions. We can instead be like Christ. Have you ever wondered who really is thinking about us? how much God actually thinks about us. Look what it says in Psalm 139. See the difference between the people that are around us and, and God's relationship with us. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and you're acquainted with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, and I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will, shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Isn't that beautiful? That when you're, you're drifting away, that God's hand is still with you. Maybe God's opinion of us should be more important than other people's opinion of us. Maybe God's view through his scripture should be more important to us than a post, a comment, an angry look, and somebody as we walk through life. This can give us true power to live as Christ. Wants us to live. In verse 13, Paul just starts going. Now, have you ever been around somebody that's a really good storyteller? And that when they get excited about a story and they just like start bouncing and start telling you, and they're like, man, I want to go to that restaurant or I want to go to that place. It sounds amazing. This is what Paul's fixing to get into. He's fixing to just like, this is how incredible God is. Look how he describes it. it says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. God gives life to all things. If you have an area of your life that just feels dead, God brings life to all things. You have a relationship that's been severed and cut off. 
and you need some resurrection power in that, we run to Jesus. He is the one who can bring life to all things. Why do we want to just live in darkness? Why do we want to live broken lives? When we can run to Christ who gives life to all things. And of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. So let's go back into John. A little bit earlier in John chapter 18, Pilate is questioning Jesus. Right? And here's Jesus' answer to him. He says, then, Je- then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside. Pilate is right before Jesus. He says, what is truth? And then he walks away. Don't you wish he had heard the answer? Don't you wish he would have stayed? And then Jesus could have just kind of unpacked that statement a little further for us to give us a more solid foundation for truth, which is what our world is lacking, is a true, absolute truth that this word is truth. And yet he walks away. Let's not be people that walk away. Let's be people that press into the truth. Verse 14 says, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Anybody ready for that proper time? Anybody ready for Jesus to return? Like, let's rip the ceiling off right now, right? Let's amphitheater it so we can be ready for him to return. That would be amazing. That would be like the best worship ever, all right? But at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign The only sovereign, the only one ruling over all things, there's no one like our God. The king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one alone who has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. Why would we ever sit in darkness when God is the unapproachable light? When people looked at him, they went away and their face was glowing. This is the God. He, we shouldn't sit in darkness. We shouldn't sit in brokenness because he gives life. He's the unapproachable light that, to whom no one has ever seen or can see that. No one has seen him in all of his glory because it would cost them their lives. And someday we're going to get to see him on his throne when we get to be with him in eternity. To him be honor in eternal dominion. Amen. You know when Paul says amen after it, he's been going. Right, he, got, he got worked up a little bit, so I, I love that. And, and he finishes out with some practical advice for Timothy that we want to close with here. He says, verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, guys, let's be honest, this is us. In the scope of the world, we have so much. I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes in America, but we are so blessed in the United States of America. And so this is a teaching that in this present age we need to be listening to. Right, it says, charge them not to be haughty. Don't let pride creep in. What is pride? You begin to elevate yourself to the position of God, where you think you can take care of it all. Do you remember that parable that Jesus talks about? The, the rich man is like, oh, I have so much. I'm going to tear down these barns and make bigger ones. And yet God said, yeah, but tonight your life is going to be, you're going to be with me <laughs> tonight. So all the riches in the world, we don't get to take with us in that respect nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Where is your hope set? Is your hope set on God? Is your hope set on the next paycheck? Yet God is our provider. Do you remember back in Psalm 42, we, we read it this summer, and it had these verses, and then it had this kind of chorus that, where it's talking about, why are you downcast, oh, my soul? Why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God, right? This is a constant theme throughout the Bible that we put our hope in him. They, do, they are to do good, verse 18, to be rich in good works. So if we're going to be rich in something, we need to be rich in good works. That, that our, the account that we have is not our bank account, but it's the account of how we live in our life as a reflection of him and, and, and being generous and ready to share with one another, that we're being generous with what God has blessed us with, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that 
which is truly life. If you want to have true life, allow God to work through you in the lives of others. If you're struggling with depression, don't isolate in darkness. Go serve someone. I know you're not going to feel like doing it, but go do it. Because when you begin to serve other people, there's something about serving others that God just brings the hope of glory into your life. And then verse 20 says, Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. I love how the Bible does some air quotes here. Right? That people in the world are going to think they have, quote, unquote, knowledge in our world. But what is that knowledge going to cause them to do? By professing it, some have swerved from the faith. You know, last night I was driving home from College Station. I got to go visit my son, Kale, um, there. And so there might have been a little swerving. It's not the best place to, like, look over your sermon when you're driving down because the computer is really big over there, right, just telling you. So I had to close that and just pray <laughs> as we came home. Um, but we swerve so often because we think we've learned something new in our society. We think we're so much smarter now. In our society. Question, do you feel like we're smarter now? Yes. Like, I don't know my kids' phone numbers. Smartphones have made me not as smart anymore. Because I don't need to memorize things anymore because I can just Google it. And so knowledge sometimes doesn't progress us in that. Do we think we're smarter than the people that were walking with Jesus? So we trust this word more than we trust the knowledge of the world. Um, there's one, if I had to take one word, as we're summing it all up here, if I had to take one word that summed up all of 1 Timothy, it would be the word entrusted. The word entrusted. What does the word entrusted mean? It means that if I have something of value, or I have something of value, and I was to give it to Ian, I'm like, hey, I want to give you this in order to accomplish this. I'm entrusting that what I'm giving of him has great value, and he's supposed to do something with that. Right, entrusting. I trust him. I'm giving this to him in order to accomplish something with him. So what God has done to us is he's entrusted us with the gospel, not for ourselves, not to spend on our own pleasures, but in order to give it to others, to be his hands and his feet to bless other people. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do this week is find where you can be generous and where you can find people that you can serve and love and be the hands and feet of Jesus with. And we're going to close with a song, just a time of reflection as we close this book. And the song is called My Heart is Yours. And so I want to just pray that as you're, as you're singing these words, maybe stop for a second. Do I really mean it? Like, do these words really reflect my heart in this? Lord Jesus, we come before you. So thankful for First Timothy and just the wisdom that has been uh, brought forth from this book, Lord, and I just pray right now that you will encourage us today through your word, that you'll help us to pursue godliness and righteousness and love and steadfastness, Lord. Help us pursue the things that are good. Help us to flee from evil. Lord, I pray that you will build in us just a desire um, to worship you and to praise you, just as Paul busts into worship right in the middle, that you are the, the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I pray that that will be constantly in our heart and our mind, Lord. I pray that you help us to break the bonds of others that have power over our life, Lord, that we will let your opinion mean more than the opinion of man. Lord, help us fight the good fight for the faith of Jesus Christ. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus, the one and only. Amen. We're going to sing this song called um, My Heart is Yours.
section that, that I think I'm going to be able to do better than you, Lord. Give us, forgive us, God, take it all. Our heart is yours. Amen. Church, we love you. We're so glad you decided to hang with us this morning, spend time with the family. A couple of things I wanted to say. I wanted to remind you about the work day, in case you forgot. Um, I wanted to say that lunch will be provided. So um, after third service, there will be food here for those that decide to, to come and help out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one to four today. And if you can't be there all three hours, that's fine. Don't think, oh, I can't commit that. Just come when you can. That's fine. Um, the next thing I wanted to say is today is Discover class. And so if you're new to our church, you're not a member of our church, um, it's happening during third service. So in the service after this, um, and lunch will be provided for that. Get lunch at Discover and then get lunch again at the workday. I don't know. Eat a bunch. But um, if you're wondering about how our church operates and um, why we believe what we believe and how do we practice those things, you would, you would just go to that class and uh, that's for you. So uh, I want to let you know that's happening this morning. Other than that, church, we love you. You're dismissed. One, two.